Before we dive into the episode, I want to ask you something. How would it feel to be able to get up each morning knowing that you call the shots? That you can live and work when, where, how, and with whom you choose? That you get to reap all the benefits of your own talent and expertise and are no longer slaving for someone else's dream, but living your own? You get all this and more with a digital business. And if you'd love to start one but have no idea where to begin, then I have something just for you. I've created a free resource called the Digital Business Quick Start Guide. By downloading this guide, you'll discover my simple digital business launch formula that will help you design your business fundamentals and learn what you need to do next to get your business launched fast. So head on over to nicolohara.com forward slash quick start hyphen guide, or you'll find the link in the show notes to download your guide now and get started on your way to finding the freedom and success only a digital business can give you. Do it now. Don't waste another second of your time that you could be planning your digital business launch. Your future self will thank you. Now go and enjoy the episode. If there's one thing that can derail your life transformation plans, it's procrastination. It shows up wherever you're unsure of yourself, when something is difficult, or sometimes just hard work. Suddenly you stop working on what's important and can start on other tasks like rearranging your drawer or tidying the office cupboard, or if you work from home, having a wardrobe clear out. Everything becomes more important than the one thing that's going to make the biggest difference in your life, or the thing that is the most urgent but also the hardest. In this episode, we're going to look into what procrastination is, how it can show up in your life so you can recognize it when you're coming to it. And I'm also sharing with you the top four techniques that I swear by to make sure procrastination does not stop you achieving your new life goals. So without further delay, let's dive in. I'm Nicola O'Hara, and I made the leap from a successful corporate career as a leader in learning, development and recruitment to launch my dream business and haven't looked back. Every week, we'll bring you step-by-step strategies, essential knowledge and tools, and share inspirational stories and practical tips so you are ready to take your leap to a career and life you love. This is the Powering Your Passion podcast. Okay, I'm going to admit something to you. If there's one thing I do really well, in fact that I'm the queen of, It's procrastination. Seriously, if I let myself, I could spend hours whiling away time doing anything but what I should be doing. I call it my delay demon. I don't want to give in to the demon. In fact, if someone could find the cure to his evil ways forever, I would be at the front of the queue to buy it. And this is really quite ironic, as I've spent a lot of my career training people in time management and productivity. But I still haven't cracked the desire to suddenly want to clean my house from top to bottom when really I should be tackling my business plan or writing the overview for my next course. Procrastination is the act of delaying or putting off tasks until the last minute or past their deadline, usually because it's unpleasant, difficult or maybe boring. You do this knowing that it will not be good for you to delay the inevitable and that you will eventually have to get it done. So you're actually hurting yourself in the long run. So really why do we do it? According to Wikipedia, the word originated from the Latin word procrastinatus, which itself evolved from the prefix pro, meaning forward, and crastinus, meaning of tomorrow. That actually reminds me of another word, mañana, which is a Spanish word for tomorrow and is commonly used to talk about putting things off until tomorrow. As there's always tomorrow to get things done, right? And how I've always naturally been a bit of a last minuter, you know, getting assignments done, submitted just before the deadline, or putting off conversations until they actually have to happen. I told myself that I did it because I work best under pressure. And for a long time, that really played out. I remember one time at university having a deadline to get an essay written the next day. And I barely started when a friend called asking if I wanted to go to the cinema that evening. I immediately grabbed onto the excuse to delay tackling the work, and found myself arriving back after 11pm with the essay still unfinished. So I loaded up on coffee, worked through the night to get it done, and just about managed to get it submitted before the deadline. And guess what? 
I got my highest mark for the year on that paper. So this gave me comfort that my last minute technique was the way to go. And I told myself the focus I could achieve with a tight deadline was perfect. It did mean that I was always under pressure and there was always a risk that something would happen that would put me off course. This last minute thing was not because I didn't plan. In fact, I would always plan to de- in detail how I get si- assignments done before time in university and then later on when I started in my early career. But invariably, the procrastination demon would raise its ugly head and smash through those plans. If anything was a bit challenging or required me to get out of my comfort zone, I would find a whole load of more interesting or urgent things to do before it until it just had to be done. This last minute plan actually worked for a long time. And then eventually my luck ran out. I was working on a big project in my first job, which was time sensitive and really important to my team and department. As always, despite me planning my part well, I got sidetracked by the delay demon and again was leaving it until the last minute. But I was confident I'd get it done. I knew I knew my capabilities. I knew that I'll be able to do it, even if I had to pull one of my classical nighters. But then I got sick. I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it was something like norovirus or something. But it was one of those things you just can't work through. And I had to admit to my boss that I was not close to getting my part of the project done. This was not only really embarrassing, it was not great for my performance evaluation. And the worst thing was I really felt I'd let my colleagues down. Now my team picked it up and overall the project came in on time, but I learned a big lesson. The truth is that when you have a team working with you or people relying on your input, you don't have the luxury to leave things to the last minute. And as I progressed in my career and the stakes got higher, I realized that I had to work differently and find ways to help me deal with the demon or I just wasn't going to get very far. The first thing you need to know is that procrastination can show up in different ways. Accountability coaches Ali Schiller and Marissa Wasver have divided them into four types. The first is the performer, who usually says, I work well under pressure. Sound familiar? (laughs) This type forces themselves to focus by shrinking the time they have to tackle a task. Exactly as I used to think when leaving projects at the last minute. The second one is the self-deprecator. This procrastinator really beats themselves up over how lazy they are and how frustrated they are that they have not got done what they should have got done. Often they are the opposite of lazy and are blaming their inaction on laziness rather than admit they are actually tired or even unwell. The third is the overbooker who says, oh, I'm so busy. When busyness comes up as an excuse for not doing something, it's usually an indication of avoidance. Rather than facing a challenge head on or admitting they don't want to do something, it's easier to place the blame on having other important things to do. So it's important for you to understand and identify what you're actually avoiding. And the fourth is the novelty seeker, which is really a case of shiny object syndrome. They're constantly coming up with new projects or ideas to take on. However, they end up inadvertently losing a lot of time and burning out because they don't take consistent action in one direction long enough to see those final results. Now, I think these categorizations are useful to break down how procrastination can show up, but I don't think you're just one type. I think it depends on the circumstances, how you react. My procrastination has shown up as all these types at one time or another. What about you? Do you recognize the way that you can procrastinate? Have you found yourself avoiding getting things done by saying you're too busy or getting distracted with things that seem more interesting? Or do you think you're super paralyzed in your last minute inspiration? Or maybe you're always really hard on yourself saying that you're lazy if you're not getting your tasks done. So I hear you ask, what can you do when you're tempted to avoid doing what you know needs to be done? Procrastination is a habit and habits can be changed, but some people have it more ingrained than others, and it can be harder to shift completely. I've come to the conclusion over the years that my instinct will always be to procrastinate when I have something difficult to tackle. It's my, it's my go-to. But although I haven't found a cure, I have learned a variety of techniques that have helped me kick my delay demon to the curb when he raises his ugly head. The first is the Pomodoro technique, which was developed by Francesco Cirillo in late 1980s. The name comes from the Italian word for tomato, 
after the tomato-shaped kitchen timer Cirilla used as a university student. This technique is great if you are dreading doing something that's difficult or will take you out of your comfort zone but needs to be done. The idea is you break your work day into 25-minute chunks separated by five-minute breaks. These intervals are referred to as pomodoros. After the four pomodoros, you take a longer break of about 15 to 20 minutes. Now, the theory behind this is that by working in timed bursts, there's a sense of urgency and you're less likely to get distracted by other tasks or social media during the 25 minute focus time. In addition, it's far easier to face something difficult if you, if you know it's not going to be for too long. And then once you're into it, you usually find some kind of flow. But it's important to take the breaks when the timer goes so you get into the habit of working this way. You can use your timer on the phone or you can get a physical timer like Cirillo had or there are loads of apps that can allow you to set timers for time management and productivity. My favourite is Forest, which can be used on iOS and Android. There's also one called Focus Keeper or Pomodoro Timer Lite for Android and links to all of these can be found in the show notes. I know it can sound a little bit controlled and overkill, and to be honest, I don't work this way all the time, as I do like to have some more freedom for creativity sometimes. But when you need to focus and get something done that you really feel like procrastinating on, then it is really a great method. Next up is the Swiss cheese technique. So think about the type of hard cheese has lots of holes in it. So this technique is great when you struggle getting started on a project because it seems too big or too difficult or you're a little bit overwhelmed. It comes from Alan Lakin's book, How to Get Control of Your Time and Your Life. He advises that if you're putting off starting a project or task, poke holes in it like like Swiss cheese. In other words, come at it from different angles and bite-sized easy ways. The holes represent small parts of this task that take small chunks of time. Once you've made a few holes, the overall task will seem less scary or difficult. So choose whatever you'll find the easiest to start from and then do it. Write out all the tasks you need to do, then choose a few that will take you a short time to complete that that are easier. They can be from any part of the project as long as they're easy to do. For example, if you were baking a cake, you might make the icing or decide how you're decorating or get all the ingredients weighed out first. Anything that's just going to get you started and it's fairly easy to do. Or if you are writing a book, you might start a chapter halfway through if you know exactly what will happen then, but are not really sure how the book will start. Then once started, invariably the ideas start to flow and you shake off that demon. I love this technique and I have to say it really, really works. The next one is more challenging, but very powerful. It's time to eat that frog. Mark Twain once said, if it's your job to eat a frog, it's best to do it first thing in the morning. And if it's your job to eat two frogs, it's best to eat the biggest one first. Eat a live frog first thing in the morning and nothing worse will happen to you the rest of the day. Now, author Brian Tracy used this quote as a basis for the eat that frog method in his book of the same name. The frog is that one thing you have to do that you don't want to do for whatever reason, but that you need to do. If you're delaying something that you're dreading, like making a phone call to a difficult client or writing a really critical part of a presentation or book, get it done first thing in the day before you get a chance to overthink it and blow blow it up in your mind too much. Eating that frog means just do it. Otherwise, the frog will eat you, meaning that you'll end up procrastinating about it the whole day, which can leave you feeling frustrated, stuck and angry at yourself. I know you felt that way at some time or another. All you can think about is what you haven't done and your dread grows bigger and bigger, distracting you from your other tasks in the day. Eating that frog early can leave you feeling exhilarated, confident, and you get even more done on on the back of the adrenaline rush you get from swallowing that frog early. So give it a try. Last up is the one thing method. This is based on the book, The One Thing by Gary Peller. As it sounds like, it means choosing the one thing you'll get done that day. This is to beat the symptoms of the bright shiny object syndrome when you're distracted from what you should be doing because you spot equally interesting and important tasks or projects. You end up starting lots of things and actually never finishing any of them. 
The one thing method gets you to think about the one thing you must do that day that will move the dial most for you in your life, career or business. And you can't do anything else until it's done. If other ideas occur to you, you can write them down to pursue later, but you don't let them derail you. The book encourages you to ask yourself the question, what's the one thing I can do that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? Then spend at least four hours of the day on that one thing. This is really powerful, as if you're honest with yourself when you answer the question, you'll know what you should be working on and can use one or more of the other techniques I've just mentioned to get started and to keep going. All these techniques are to help you focus on what's important, get started, keep going, and get to the finish line well before the deadline. They've been invaluable to me, and I pull them out all the time to help me battle my delay demon. The bottom line is, when you're making big changes in your life, the delay demon will show up more often, as big changes can feel overwhelming. It's natural to shy away from things that seem hard or scary. The important thing is to realize that when you you feel that demon raising its head, recognize how he's showing up and take the appropriate action to stop him from derailing your plans to achieve your goals and dreams. That's it for this week. Join me in in the next episode. And remember, everyone deserves to live their passion. So get started. This is your time. Thanks so much for listening. And if you'd like to listen to more episodes, follow or subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, Google or Stitcher, or go to my website, nicolaohara.com forward slash podcast.